Kino's back on the menu, boys. Sky Deferred is special. It's a powerful antibiotic to the absolute filler that infected Sky FC and SC. It speaks the language of Trails far less than any other Trails title. And it isn't concerned with fitting in. It's an anomaly, and that's the best thing about it. Well, that and the soundtrack kicks the absolute shit out of all the others in the trilogy. It also represents just how good Trails can be when the writers unshackle themselves from their own self-imposed creative restrictions and tired habits. Or as I call it, the formula. <laughs> In just two games, Falcon managed to become so formulaic that they wouldn't dare deviate from that formula, even if it meant so much filler that the first two games could have been halved and combined into one 50 to 60 hour experience. But then Sky the Third walked in and pissed all over them in every conceivable way, and here we are. No more endless filler, no more massive padding, just pure 100% onion. 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 We're saying goodbye to LeBurl with essentially a bridge game, designed to close a chapter on the LeBurl arc while simultaneously opening up a new path to Crossbell. We'll also learn about the really cool Gral's Ritter, some Gehenna lore, and all sorts of other cool stuff. Why is Onion Graham a candidate for the best protagonist in the history of the series? And why does my fridge make those noises? All this and more in this episode of In It. Mm. The departure of the old ways of Trails is perhaps most evident as early as the prologue when we're thrown right into it. Immediately we're infiltrating a party on an airship, meeting Marquis Ballard, and beating the crap out of some guys. The battle music is this crazy distorted guitar with this guttural tone and the whole atmosphere has completely transmogrified from the first two games into this exciting experience with this new unpredictable aura. It's really fun. This prologue sets the tone, it gets you back into the swing of things with the battle mechanics, fun dialogue, characterizes a mysterious protagonist, and it does all of it without dragging its balls along the floor. So we're on an artifact retrieval mission. We are grabbing a special artifact that allows one to tell any lie and have it appear as truth. I think it's the one that people use when they say that Kuro Nakaseki is a great starting point to the Trail series. All right, I'll let it go. Shit. Onion gets locked in. Love how unbothered he is by it. He just beats the crap out of everyone. He just takes the bad guy with a scruff of his ass and jumps out of a window. End of story. What an opener. It's Ayn, first dominion of the Graals Ritter, the organization to whom we belong. We're part of the Septian Church, albeit a secret part that the public barely even know is real. Ayn's cool, if not painfully underutilized as a character. I thought the Oriole had come back. <laughs> Dorothy appears, and hopefully this tells you how Kevin got his nickname. Sorry, did I say Kevin? I meant Onion. Of course I did. Did you know, Onion Graham is also a fashion model. Erica appears, she's Tita's mum, and a crazy bitch. She hates Agat though, so she's based. Her secret power is the most powerful force in the universe. Takes me back. Reckless Cube! This is Reese. she likes food. Onion's been ignoring her for five years it seems. They know each other well though. Reese is cool, here she is hitting Gilbert with the blorf. Wait, who could he be? <laughs> Dude, why have a mysterious masked man when it's obvious who it is? Masks are for mystery, there's no mystery here, it's obviously Reen Schwarzer. The rec <laughs> Recluse Cube. Recluse Cube. The Recluse Cube. Fuck! <laughs> the Recluse Cube, which is really hard to say, goes really really wanky and teleports us to a crazy looking place called Phantasma. Check out this cool glitch I keep getting. Careful playing on a bigger monitor. I never used to get it before, now I do, every time. Good prologue. Straight to the point. The music too, it's it's out of this world. It's ethereal, it's secretive, it's and it's pretty. It's it's really emotionally resonant. I don't know why I, I resonate with it so much. It just gives off this aura that something incredible is about to happen in this freaky weaky place, you know? It's my favourite in the Sky series, the third soundtrack. Eventually I should probably do a top ten soundtracks in trials. Well I'm thinking of time. So, Viceman, your thoughts? Fantastic. Bloody Trails characters talking about food in great detail. Phantasma! It's our base of operations for the entirety of the game. An altered space that can be boiled down to wanky anime stuff. We'll heal here, we'll fish, chat, cook and find new party members. All sorts of things in between excursions. What you're seeing right now is one of the many mini dungeons of the game. I call them that anyway, that's basically what they seem to be. If you want to run for it quick on turbo mode, the game ain't going to punish you for it. This is going to lead to a lot of battles, but eventually it becomes a sort of high tempo flow before juggling the need to level up what will eventually become a decently sized roster. Compared to the last game, more battles is fine with me, and so is more dungeons actually, because the pacing of the story is actually much better now. It all just feels more flowing. It's not so much about how many battles there are as how long they feel. I mean, I could play Nier Automata for five hours and it feels like one, but I could play Sky FC for five hours and it feels like 50. Fast travel unlocked via the cube. Yes, Tita appears. See this door? This is a moon door. Doors are how we access side content in Sky the Third, with the exception of this one. You can take them at your own pace, and unlocking them varies based on a door in question. Some require simply having a certain character unlocked in your party, whereas one is locked behind 400 battle victories. That one is annoying, that was a low point. The most interesting one actually requires all others to be unlocked, that includes mini games. Turbo mode is essential. On top of this is the fact that the main dungeon for which you access these things has both fast travel between different areas 
and fast traveling straight to already discovered doors. And just in case that isn't enough, the dungeon itself has a map. This game is better than the first and second in literally every way. <laughs> oh, as for the doors, here are the three types. Moon doors are for longer story missions, rarely with any gameplay, usually around the half an hour to an hour mark. Star doors are for shorter stories, and the sun doors are mini games. Now I won't go into the specifics of each door because the four hour retrospective is future Luke's thing on a different channel, and I would hate to deprive him of that hemorrhoid. So I'll sum it up briefly. If and only if they are worth summing up, otherwise I'd go too insane to finish the video. Yeah. And aside, the PC port was a mess for me, and it's about the only thing you can play it on, really, unless you got some old console, like a PSP or a Vita or whatever the hell it was on. And for many others, too, judging by the searching that I did, if you even dare to tab out, then you are probably going to crash your entire PC if you had anything like my experience, and not just your game. The frame rate takes a massive dump in certain areas. It doesn't seem to like my OBS application, and they always fight, like Erica and Albert Russell. And when I tried the normal version instead of the DX9 version, whatever the hell that even means, it just froze on the title screen for the recording and I missed like an hour of gameplay. <laughs> that said, it was a little more stable on my smaller monitor back in the day, so my results may vary. I love how animated these ceiling stones are, they have so much personality. Julie is inside it. This is how we find our friends, they're, they're trapped inside the stones. They are the stones, maybe? Bro, I'm not Louvre. I'm Schwarz Return. So yeah, nice pacing. No padding here, just a few story beats, a fun moon door and some new mechanics. And a character or two. Adios hates padding. Weissman, what do you reckon? I am cold. I bet you are. The opening cutscene here is about Onion's backstory, and he looks like someone shrunk Squidward. I'm with SpongeBob, racing down the Autobahn while I'm in the backseat trying to fuck Megatron. So the midget here is Reese as a child, her older sister is Rafina, and Onion is in an alleyway all alone as a kid. Rufina offers him some chocolate, but the Onion doesn't trust anyone, so she forces the chocolate on him via mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, which is sexual assault on a minor. What did she do, like regurgitate it into him? Kiss it into him? Falcon, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? Could you like lay off the paedophilia and the sexual assault for like one game? It's not asking that much, is it, really? It adds nothing. It, granted, it's nowhere near as bad as in the later games where there's a minigame where you literally really got to oogle at characters. Jesus Christ. Fuck me. Anyway, uh, the pedo died at some point. <laughs> Going into Reese, so I guess Adios didn't like it either. You know, I think I'm on Team Adios now. On a side note, the aesthetics in this game are insanely cool. The floating corridors in space, the psychedelic colour scheme, the music that plays in the Jade Corridor that hopefully I'm playing right now. It's like a synthetic sitar. It's completely otherworldly. I've never heard anything like it. It really, really excites me when I listen to it. Gransel. Not really. It's a fake. Gransel is cancelled. My boy Mueller, he's finally fully playable. I will celebrate this by using him for five minutes and then swapping him out for someone better. Josette, nobody cares. Joshy boy, right Mueller, you're out. Gilbert, we have to bail him out. He runs away to be blorfed another day. I am a ghost woman. Hey, another person in a mask. The Lord of Phantasma. This place is an illusion. Fight this boss to receive golden piss crystal. Boss beaten. <laughs> this chapter's not too interesting, but thankfully short too. Ho <laughs> ho. You have unlocked. Chloe and Scree. Call out Sieg gets his own stone. Scree. I like him. I love this track and this little dungeon. Golden Sun Silver Moon, I think is its name. I should probably confirm that. It'll be in the track list and the uh, description. There's always a track list in the description now. The music's a pure vibe here too. It's consistently really experimental and really catchy. They managed to toe that line between experimentation and melody. It's a breath of fresh air. This is the power of anime. Bearers of the Grail Emblem, can you hear me y yes we can yes mrs ghost i entrust the operation to the monument before you <coughs> mirrors the trial must be completed oh reese's final s craft is one of the coolest in the series it's it's really overkill we're on a new game plus though so we have it already but damn it's insane like that is the coolest s craft i've seen since like gaius's in cold steel 4. you know it really makes the balls vibrate Chapter 4 and a flashback shows Onion being named a squire in the Septune Church. They're below the Dominions. I believe it goes Squire, Knight, Dominion. I think. Well, they're the Graz Rider. We see Ayn, a Dominion. She's Onion's instructor in the past. Onion seems a lot more mature now. It's nice to see. Double Piss Crystal. You have unlocked Punchy Man and Sex Pest. Reese calls out the Onion for putting on a cheery facade even though he's in pain, which the game's been alluding to the whole time. And she slaps the shit out of him for denying it. Jeez, they're assaulting each other and one of the villains. Joshy Boy confronts him, and Onion has some good development here, admitting that he knew that Estelle may get kidnapped in the last game, but still used her as bait, but Joshy owes him a debt, since Onion actually removed his stigma that Weissman implanted in him in the last game. No, I didn't. Onion sure is mysterious. Annalise, 
Cuteness something something. She's asleep, so all of that makes a comment about sleeping alongside her and reaching paradise. I figured it out though. I figured it out. I played Cold Steel 1 as my first Trails game, where he's a lot more chill and funny and laid back. So going back and seeing a Sky Persona where he has to put on this Olivier Travelling Bard shit, you know, it's quite the disparity. At least I turned it down later, but it's, it's just so boring at this point. It adds nothing. It just makes me want him to get like blown up in an airship tragedy and lose his eye. Hmm. I understand that it's all a persona that he puts on, but, you know, repetition of writing, you know, it's, it's just... Uh. Gilbert's being crucified, and unfortunately there's no option to, like, let it happen. So we bail comedy relief wanker out again. I'm starting to think he might not actually be Adios. I know it's an earth-shattering theory, but I'm just I'm starting to have reservations about my own theories. A thingy. Reese goes hardcore mode on it, and it's an awesome scene where the music does a lot of the heavy lifting. And it feels like the power of anime. And a semi-peak trails moment. Only a semi. Not quite peak, but close. Nearly there. Then she gets her ass swatted, and Onion peels off his onion limiters and goes full onion. 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 He activates his stigma to help us all, and, you know, don't hurt Reese or the onion will make you cry. Sunshine girl. Estelle's finally here. Straight in the team she goes. Onion down. He used his stigma, which really knocks it out of you, apparently. It's like going to the mementos in Persona 5. Words are difficult. So I'll explain stigmas now, because mine is obviously affecting my speech. They're a cool concept. A stigma is essentially a power that all dominions share. And the church calls it an engraving upon the soul. I don't know if that's localization bollocks or if that's actually the translation. Either way, we have 12 dominions at any one time, and that makes it a very unique thing. Weissman tried reproducing it with Joshua, but he's salt now. Right, Weissman? A flashback shows us that Onion has become the fifth Dominion after Rufina's death, and I realised that the flashback at the start of a chapter, formula, if you will, kind of helps keep the game fresh with a new bit of lore every few hours. Sort of helps to differentiate the chapters, helps to demystify it a bit, and keeps it all together at the same time. We're peeling off the many layers of the Onion, you know? Not all formulas are bad, I guess. We witness his transformation into Heretic Hunter, Onion Graham. He's obviously punishing himself, and he hates himself deeply. We'll find out why later on. So he's taking on the dirtiest, shittiest jobs he can find. Dick, my boy, straight in the party you go. The abundance of playable characters is really fun now, but I know I'll never use most of them until forced to, but I imagine a lot of people will. So I think it's a good thing to have. Everyone plays the game differently. Personally, I'd have really cared about combat, I'd just use my favourites, but maybe some people want to experiment with party members, so I imagine they'll have a lot of fun with this one. I wonder who this stone could be. So that makes 16 playable characters in total, and we've unlocked them all because it's Rennie. I love Rennie. She thinks it's a dream at first, but then she realises it's not, and then she's not nice to us anymore. But then Reese gives us some attitude back. Reese is cool, but Rennie's like, come on then, bitch. So it's on Tita to use her special power to disarm Rennie's righteous indignation. The power is shouting loudly at both of them. It's super effective, and she really is the most powerful force in the universe. Reddy is now part of the crew. Purple stone. Upon returning, we unlock it to find Ghost Lady, whose name is Celeste de Oslais, Chloe's royal ancestor, who was mentioned in the Liberarch lore. A Liberarch as Liberarch, Luke. Jesus, come on, get, get your fucking anime terminology, right? And that's chapter five. Now we're really moving. Great pace in small dungeons, lots of story, but spaced out very nicely. Not too far apart, not too close. I remember people complaining about this, but it's much better than go to village, talk to random nobody with a name, do unimportant errand, return to the guild. Wait, she ain't the real Celeste. She is just a phantom. She's a shadow, a line that to this day has something and she's a grandmaster. Personally, I don't buy it. Maybe she is, but other than being underwhelming, she just ain't that special. So I don't think she is. She's just a replica of the founder of the Bell's royal family from ancient times, Chloe's ancestor. I prefer Grandmaster Tita myself. We initiate not Celeste into our circle of friendship with the Holy Circle Run and Ren surprises me on a highway. <laughs> the monochrome schoolhouse has a really special soundtrack to it. Sounds like a Japanese shrine when you're on LSD, full of ghosts that seem spooky but also peaceful. It's a weird dissonance, I kind of like that mix of emotions and songs. It's one of those things that only games can really pull off. This chapter is probably the closest we'll get to the formulaic habits of Falcom in the Sky, FC and SC era. Four dungeons, a boss at the end of each one, but mercifully short, and with some good character moments like Richard's reconciliation with himself after fighting. <laughs> Stasius, right. If you bring along Ren, Stasius actually invites her to the Bright family household. Joshua and Estelle want to adopt her as a little sibling. And Stasius is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm collecting Ouroboros members, mate. Gotta catch them all. I wish I'd brought Estelle and Joshua, though, just to see what happens. And I looked it online, but I couldn't find them. Shadow. It was Shadow the Hedgehog all along. Shocker. All right, Luve then. It was Luve all along. He was summoned here despite being very definitively and definitely dead. And this is his ghost, I guess. <laughs> 
Or is it real? I think it's his ghost. They make no mention of him being a phantom or a replica or anything, so I'll assume it's really him. It's all pisses all over his death in the last game. To have him immediately turn up in the next one but with a mask on, but that said, Joshi and Rennie have a lovely goodbye with him because I bring them along. I never noticed this the first time, but as Luve disappears, there's a woman behind him, and I'm pretty sure it's Karen. So they made a little model for her just for this one bit. And it's that kind of thing that's like really dedicated, and I really appreciate that. That's a lovely, lovely touch. Depression now, with Alster House, and the music is really special, creepy and soothing all the same. Onion's backstory is finally revealed properly, and this is where he and Reese grew up, but his story's a really tragic one, and not just because his mum didn't have a face. It's really dark, and it's really sudden, but it also feels as though they've been building up to it. It's just a nice contrast to what's come before and what will come next, where the series is going. This game really is an anomaly. It's crazy to think that Falcom, who have written some of the most juvenile crap I've ever seen, wrote this, but when he was small, Onion's mother actually tried to kill him. He managed to escape, but returned home to find that she'd taken her own life in the interim. He also killed Rufina. It was when his stigma activated for the first time and he lost almost complete control of it, leading to this fucking brutal picture. Jeez, that, let's put someone else there. Perfect. And that's why Phantasma fed off of Onion, his desire to punish himself. Phantasma provides you with everything you want, all of the fictitious fantasies you could ever need, and Kevin's, sorry, Onion's, was to be punished. So the Lord of Whatever reveals their face, and of course it's, it's Rufina. It ain't the real her though, it's just a... a <clears throat> Just a phantom. Onion unconsciously created it, along with Phantasma, to punish himself for what he did, as I stated just now. So Reese is literally dragged down into Gehenna, that's Trail's hell, and Onion literally jumps down into hell to catch her. He's a romantic Onion. Gehenna's fucking awesome, man. It's essentially what Onion imagines hell to be, but I like the idea that for every friendship speech in the future, there exists this underworld. <laughs> it helps keep me sane. The disgusting creatures that Onion and Reese face here are actually all from his past, one actually being a kid that was experimented on by a cult. It might be the DG cult from the next few games, I'm unsure, but I love how dark this is. It's surreal to see this after playing the new games. If Adios exists, she has a lot to answer for. Weissman, your thoughts? I have returned. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, not really. I'm just another phantom. Ooh. And down again. Ooh. Bloody shit's out of chest. Monsters, no. Wait, Gilbert, what are you- Wait, monsters are hungry for the onion. Wait, a door. A golden light. The power of friendship is opening the door. This is the power of anime. Could this be the 21st century Kino? It's literally wrestling. It's so cringy. It's great. Everyone band together. I love this trope. Team Raw is here to fight those beta bitches from SmackDown. It's SmackDown, it's Raw, it's a bar fight. Friendship moment. I love this shit so much. You can only really do this with such a big cast of characters. Now, Rufina waits for us in the finale. But first, the doors. Fun doors only. The boring ones suck ass. The side content lives on in these doors, so let's see what they have to offer at least. I do have another issue I saw coming a mile off though. No matter how much I trim this video's notes, it's far too long because it's a Trails game. So in the interest of time, only the very, very best. Moondor 3 introduces Lecter, a lazy dude who's sentimental and does care, but he's also irresponsible and selfish. Lucy Salem debuts as well, but I don't know how relevant that is considering she won't appear again until Cold Steel 4. Lecter's annoying and I shout at him sometimes, but I think he's a good dude. There will be a great callback to this side uh, story, if you will. Well, it'll happen in approximately seven games. So look forward to that in Reverie. <laughs> Moondor 1.2 involves watching Erica torture Agate for a while while being a legit psychopath. It's wonderful, it's very based. So Staldor 2 tells us of the Salt Pail, a mysterious giant object that killed a third of Northambria's population when it appeared from out of nowhere and turned much of the place into literal salt. Here's Northambria on the map. It's a really cool bit of lore and I really want to know what's up with it, but they end with a few theories only. Something Septarian, something Spatial Translocation. I think I'm on that theory. It will be alluded to in Cold Steel 4, but not confirmed, and that's the ninth game. So until then, don't worry yourself with it. The writers certainly didn't. I love this line. A number of important questions remain unanswered. I'm going to be using that later. Start all 15. Ready. This is the closest Falcom ever got to being taken seriously, I think. Start all 15 is still actually talked about today even now because in a game of friendship speeches, repetition and cringy anime tropes, this was where they really let loose the chains. It's challenging, it's thought provoking and I was not looking forward to it. It involves Ren as a child, being a child prostitute in a brothel named Paradise. Now I wrote a whole piece on this but halfway through I just stopped. You know, it's, it's one thing to play it but writing it out in great detail really fucked with me. So I, I, I'm just not going to go there. It's out there, if you want to watch it, be warned, it's dark. But it is expertly depicted and it's very mature in how it goes about it. You know, I'll likely be returning to this as an example of how insanely talented Falcom can be at writing things, and how 
when they have their act together, they can tackle even the most difficult subjects with maturity. But I'll also bring it up just to elucidate just how far they've fallen in their depiction of anything even remotely sexual or mature in nature when the new producers and directors come in in the later arcs. This is Kondo's baby. And when the staff starts changing, their approach to these kind of things completely does a 180. I guess you could say Stardor 15 is a silver bullet that I'm keeping in my pocket for when the time's right. I'll admit that. Still, peak trails moment, but man is it heavy. Stardor 8, another really good one. Ollie Boy in a debuting Chancellor Osborne. Also, uh, Lecter works for Ozzy now. Sure, why not? The back and forth between these two is really good. It's like the Prince and the Chancellor. They both have a lot of power. It's sort of a power struggle, but Ollie has a mind for the world, while Osborne has a mind for his country. It's a perfect scene setter for the next arc. In fact, it's a perfect scene setter for the direction of the series in general. We learn that Ozzy is a cunning, ruthless man of Erebonia. He has a great degree of power there, in spite of the noble faction, which he fiercely opposes in what's gone. Oliver A's and Nobles too, but they differ in how they look at things in just about every conceivable way apart from that. The thing about Ozzy is he's immediately positioned as this big deal. It's great writing because, you know, you've got his unannounced entrance into the Queen's Hall. And it's like, geez, not many people could do that. <laughs> you see his unique character model, he's covered in black. Ollie takes issue with Ozzy's insistence on annexing everything he can, among other things. Best bit though is the ending. Ollie's little gesture here is basically a, a rosy middle finger to the Chancellor. Like, don't take me lightly, motherfucker. I've got a lot of tricks up my sleeve. And the way the music just, oh, it just hits at the perfect moment, man. It is one of the most brilliant moments in a video game. It is a peak trails moment. It is fucking 21st century Kino. It's fucking incredible. Mini games. Initially, this was going to be an extensive look at them, but after playing them again, I realized that wasn't a good idea for my mental health. So, Kapua Turret mini game. It's slow and it's clunky, but it's fun for a few minutes. Fishing sucks. Tournament arc because why not? It's actually kind of fun. Gambling before loot boxes and card packs even existed. And finally, the best one: Pizza Boys Who Wants to Be a Mirror, which starts out really easy, but then they're like, what's the square root of space sepiv? Stardor 14, Ouroboros. It's time. So it's our first intimate look at Ouroboros, and only took, what, 100 to 200 hours? Yeah, we've had to really wait for this one. The Celestial Globe, where they do their secret evil deed stuff, is our location. It's a spacey grid-like place, similar to a computer simulation. And the ever-mysterious Grandmaster finally shows herself. Kinda. Not really, though. This is what I alluded to during the final boss of FC as a corroborating evidence for my it's a simulation theory. By the way, I don't want it to be a simulation. That would feel cheap and tacky at this point. But the thing is, the series has gone on for so long as of me making this video that I don't think anything can really satisfy us properly at this point. Certainly not me. It's more a worry than anything. But hey, that's what I'm going with. I think simulation may be what we're getting at. But bloody hell, I hope not. <laughs> We find the Anguist locked in conversation, the identities of which are obscured because they're orbs. So these aren't spoilers because I'm not naming names and revealing Ouroboros members' identities, so fear not. But it's time to talk about a big problem within Falcom's writing process and the methods by which they tackle such a massive overarching series and the pitfalls that I've learned you can fall into. By Trails in the Reverie, we'll know of the identities of Anguist 2, who appears in Cold Steel 1, and also 3, 6, and 7, all of whom appear in the crossbow arc, and this will leave 1, 4, and 5, though 1 seems quite obvious by the end of Cold Steel 4 for numerous reasons. I bring this up because it's a dual-edged thing. On the one hand, I love the idea of having a secret society of villains whose identities will be revealed over time, some of whom are kind, like 7, or complex, like 2, in possession of a terrible bowl cut, like 3, you know, etc, etc. But on the other hand, it only encourages Falcom to drag things out even more, and we know they like to do that already. I understand that you still want to have a few up your sleeve, so you can have that cool, wait, cute girl was an anguish, holy shit, you know, in the later arcs, because it's cool. If you've got this writing device, why not use it? But this is less of a condition, but more a symptom of the series, because the Sky Arc could have, and I think should have been, two games. And if you're going to drag out the series for literally over two decades, you've got to keep some up your sleeve, haven't you? Unless you're introducing something new, which is, we all know, Falcom isn't the biggest fan of. Something even more interesting, though, is the biggest mystery of the entire series, the Grandmaster. The Grandmaster of Ouroboros. Even after three games, her identity remains a complete mystery. But what we do get is some emotion from her. She actually laments the deaths that resulted from the gospel plan of Ouroboros. This is their first plan. These guys are at the center of all things Kaseki, and she's the one running the show, so I can get why she feels responsible, but why be sad about Weissman? He was evil and it'll only get more odd as time goes on. Now eventually the Grandmaster, who's been alluded to since the very first game, does appear in the scene, but it's not really a proper appearance. It's just some text and a ball of orby light. I think the Japanese version is voiced. 
I think it's like the Evo version in Japan. She vaguely talks of plans and then that's it. I'll be honest though, after three games of investment in this mystical figure, it's really underwhelming. The scene itself is really cool, but stick it at the end of the first game after the Weissman reveal or at the beginning of the second, you know? Why wait all this time just to give us this little tidbit? You're really playing hard to get. Well, get used to it. Still, we have a few enforcers. We have a dead Anguis and some unknown ones. And a plan too. Ouroboros' grand plan, or rather their reason for their seemingly endless list of plans. Either way, that's Ouroboros. The Anguists are their own little club, and the enforcers are like roaming nomads. The Grandmaster's a secret biddy. Ouroboros! So the plan! The plan, of course. The Orpheus final plan is the master plan. And I guess the first part was the gospel plan, which is now done. So now it's time for the Phantasmal Frush plan. Fine, Phantasmal plays. These people and their bloody plans, I swear to god. Destination, the flying shit. Generic final dungeon with religious sounding soundtrack in the background because it's a JRPG that's split into four sections. Final boss time, I'm not showing it. So after beating her, it turns out Rafina is a copy of Onion Stigma, made manifest. It is apparently sentient. Okay, why not? Now I'm not sure if this is the real Rufina as a ghost or the copy of her, while well, partially free of the stigma. But they talk to her as though she's real, but bloody hell man, clear this up. That's amateur writing. These things are important, man. They both put an arrow through her, together, because that's the only way to end Stigma Steve's influence on her for good. And it's a very emotional scene that hits the right notes. After that, we all bid farewell, one after the other, with the emotions hitting a little more now, especially during Rennie's goodbye. Estelle says she'll catch her and make her part of the family, and Rennie's like, yeah, just try. I love you, but I hate you, but I love you, you know? So Estelle's like, all right then, challenge accepted. We'll see more of that in the next game. They all leave through the gate to crossbell arc as Phantasma collapses around him. And the final scene involves Onion asking Ayn if he can change his Dominion name. And Ayn, after laughing like a maniac, says, sure, but get Reese to choose it, you fucking nerd. Ayn feels like a missed opportunity, man. She's a really cool character, really strong apparently, and yet only turns up in character here, in like with a model, despite a fair few pictures via flashbacks. Whatever. Either way, we treat to this lovely little piece of text, and that is that. Goodbye, LaBelle. You're a cozy little place. I really hope they don't remake you in the 3D engine and kill your vibe. Luke, could I trouble you for a transition? Fuck off. Cheers. On the one hand, I do think Sky FC and SC should have been halved purge of the padding and combine to make one game, and this subsequently should have been Sky's second chapter. On the other hand though, I gotta admit, I don't really mind all that much. I'm glad this third game exists. It's my favourite of the lot, that's probably why. It took risks, sometimes they paid off, sometimes they didn't, but it was exciting, it was fresh, it was dark, it advanced things in a meaningful way, even if it didn't advance them as much as I think it should have, it still advanced them far more than it otherwise could have if they'd kept the old formula. I think what impresses me the most is the fact that it was written with an airtight focus. It shows. Now, like I said before, I'm very strict with my scores, so even a six is like, hey, pretty good. I could play it again. I guess in that vein, anything above a seven is getting in a really good territory. So as much as I'd like to give it an eight, the PC port is absolute dog shit. The overarching story is still dragging at snail's pace with the second plan, and playing it without the other games will make loads of things confusing. And there were some annoying things here and there, like the clunky mini games. so at least they tried, you know, at least they experimented with them. That said, it did advance the main overarching plot, which without any shadow of a doubt whatsoever is what Ouroboros are up to, and how it ties into the world building and the lore, like the remaining six Septarians and what it means for the world of Samaria. For Sky the Third though, a solid, very impressive for me, 7.5 out of 10. Try not to die. Thank <laughs> you.